So without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce Sandra. Sandra, go ahead and uh, turn your video on and join us here and we will go ahead and get started. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I see some much. people in here from Seattle too. That's where I am. <laughs> so I will let you take it from here. Thank you for just spending your afternoon with us. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. I'm so excited to be here and uh, thanks for having me and thanks everybody for joining me so i'm just going to go on and share my screen really quick so you can show so i can show my slides and then we'll go ahead and get started can everybody see that okay um all right so let's go ahead and do this give me just a minute okay here we go <laughs> that's making my face pink but that's okay. So, to, okay. So today I want to talk to you about the three things you need to know to start creating a natural looking light with strobes and flash. But before we get started, I do want to say hello and welcome. And I want to introduce myself a little bit, share a little of my story, um, how I got started as a photographer, but also how I got started as an educator and specifically teaching about lighting. So um, my name is Sandra Cohn. And I am an award-winning photographer based in Seattle, Washington. I specialize in newborns and families and uh, fine art portraiture here in Seattle. I also shoot exclusively on film, so I am a film photographer. But you do not have to be a film photographer to learn my style of lighting or to get something out of today's webinar. It's just what I do and how I shoot. So in addition to running my studio in Seattle, I'm an educator and I speak on a lot of different platforms and I write for publications, I speak at conferences. Um, I also have my own online um, educational platform for photographers where I teach photographers how to create natural looking light with strobes and flash. And of course, as of this year, I'm an author. I'm really excited about my new book with Rocky Nook that has just come out crafting the natural light look where again I teach you how to create a natural looking light with strobes and flash using just one light so that's a little bit about what I do now I'm super busy these days but I wasn't it wasn't always that way so I started my business way back in 1999 really is just a side hustle which I think a lot of photographers do so in 1999 I was fresh out of graduate school I was a first year teacher teaching kindergarten for Seattle Public Schools, and I was really struggling. Um, on a first year teacher salary, I actually qualified for food stamps. Um, I had always done photography for fun, but I didn't, I had no training, no formal training. I didn't even own my own camera. Um, I was borrowing a camera at the time, but I started taking pictures on the side, really just to supplement my income. It was just a way for me to make a, some, a few extra dollars and it kind of took off. And um, I officially launched my business, quitting my teaching job and all that in 2003. In 2011, that's when I started using artificial light in my work. And now I run a very successful portrait studio here in Seattle, Washington. Um, but most importantly, I've gotten to the point in my career where I can teach other photographers how to reach a level of success that they want to deserve in their own businesses. And that's what really drives me as a photographer. Um, so that's a little of my story. So, okay. So as you can see from this timeline, I've been doing this photography thing for a really long time, over 20 years at this point. And most of that time, you guys, I worked exclusively with natural light. And honestly, that was something that I was really, really proud of because natural light is beautiful. And I think knowing how to see it and how to work with it is something really special and honestly part of the magic that we do as photographers right not everybody can do that we have this this gift and this way of seeing light but the problem with natural light is that it isn't always available right like sometimes it rains i live and work in seattle i know this one really well um some days are dark and some conditions or situations that you just walk into are less than perfect. And I know we have all struggled with this. I mean, I don't know a photographer who hasn't walked into a room or come to a shoot and have it, have some problems come up now and then, like, especially with lighting. And then, you know, then what do you do? Well, that then what do you do was always my problem. So when I had beautiful weather and I had perfect light, I could produce really beautiful images. Um, this is my work circa, you know, 
2010. And these were the kind of photos that my clients were expecting of me. These were, you know, these beautiful light filled, light and airy. This is definitely my style. And um, these were the kind of photos that I was sharing on my website and in my portfolio. And this is what my clients wanted from me when they came to me. But the problem was, is that if, if the weather was bad, if I was in a low light situation, I couldn't produce that quality of work. And that caused a lot of problems. So first of all, it affected my confidence. As you know, when, when I had shoots scheduled and I would look at the weather and I knew it was gonna be a dark day or I knew it was gonna be rainy or gross, um, I would instantly feel stressed. I would feel um, worried. I, was, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to give my clients that. And that just made me feel bad, kind of made me feel like a fraud, like I shouldn't be calling myself a professional photographer, right? It also affected my work because the reality was I couldn't produce photos that looked like that if I didn't have the, the weather conditions or the lighting conditions to do it. Um, and so my work was really, really inconsistent. On beautiful days, it looked one way. And on not so beautiful days, it looked another way. And that inconsistency in my style affected my business because clients were coming to me expecting to get a certain look or a certain um, you know, image quality, and then I wasn't able to give that to them. And so what that meant was during those days, um, I would have a lot of rescheduling of sessions. I would have a lot of canceling of sessions due to the weather or the time of day people would wanna come in. And honestly, um, you know, I would have unhappy clients, people who came in expecting to get one thing and got another thing and we're unhappy with their work and that never feels good. So to work around that, you guys can just say in the chat if you can relate to any of this, but to work around unhappy clients and doing things, I would go to great lengths, right? To try to make these bad light situations work. Um, and you know, the big one was back then I was still shooting with a digital camera. And so, you know, I'd come into work and it was a dark rainy day. Um, I'd grab my digital camera and I'd crank the ISO up as high as it could go. And I would shoot wide open and at like a 60th of a second and try to get something out of the session. And when I was working with just one person, I could make that work. So like, for example, in this, this session is when I remember very well, it was super dark. We had these days in the winter here in Seattle where like the street lights never turn off. And it was one of those days. It was just really, really dark. It was super rainy. I mean, you can see the rain on the window there. And um, I was at the highest ISO my camera could go at the time. I was shooting wide open at a 60th of a second and I actually had the mom holding the baby up on the windowsill in my studio, like pressed up against the window, which was great when working with the baby. We got this, this pretty image, but, um, but then I had to photograph the whole family, right? And like, I couldn't, press the whole family up against the window. That would be weird. And then as soon as, you know, I backed the family away from the window, well, then my light starts falling off. So I lose even more light. And then you can't photograph a family of three or a family of four at, you know, F2. Somebody's going to be out of focus. And so while we got some beautiful pictures of the baby, the family session just fell apart. And they were, this was a family that was unhappy with their photos and, and I heard about it and I felt terrible. And honestly, I lost them as clients. Um, so these were the kinds of struggles that I was having uh, trying to work indoors with low light. And so then I started thinking, okay, no problem. I'll just take my families outside. Now, the problem with that is that my studio is actually right in the city. So you, I'm sure you can hear the traffic going by today, but you walk outside my doors and there's like four, four lanes of traffic. It's a very busy street. There's no, no place pretty to, you know, pose families. So I was like, okay, no problem. I'll just take them into the back and shoot them in the alleyway. So this family came in and they're wanting Christmas photos for their holiday. They were expecting studio photos, the kind of photos that I was sharing in my portfolio. You know, mom's in a dress and cute little heels and the little babies are in their Christmas sweaters. And I had to I took, decide to take them outside to the alleyway, honestly, just so I have enough light so I could get them all in focus for the photos. And you guys, this is what that alleyway looks like. So that is where we were doing their holiday photos. It was not great. It was cold. It was gross. Didn't smell good. Um, and I mean, I kind of feel like with this picture, like mom and dad are trying to make the best of the situation, right? But 
you know, look at the look on those kids' faces. Like they were calling me out and they should have because it was ridiculous. So these were the kinds of problems that I was coming up against over and over and over again when I was trying to work exclusively with natural light. And this only got worse when I started shooting film because when you're working with film, you're stuck at a certain ISO. There's no bump in your ISO up to 6,400 if you need to. Um, and so I, I, you know, I had the same problems. When I had plenty of light, I could produce beautiful photos, but when I didn't, I couldn't. And I had one uh, session in particular where I had this mom come in, she had this beautiful newborn baby. It was a dark day, I was shooting film, and the images were just awful. They came back, they were underexposed, they looked like this, right? Orange baby, wonky color shifts, all the problems you get with underexposed film. And I had to call this mom and explain that I had ruined her session. It was awful, you know? And, but this was the session where I was like, I'm done. I'm done with doing all this. I'm done feeling like a fraud. I'm done producing work that I know isn't good. I'm done losing clients and money due to poor quality. And that's when I really decided that it was time for me to get over myself and learn how to do, how to create my own light with strobes and flash. So um, that's when everything changed. So I showed you this timeline before, and I showed you that in 2011 is when I started using this um, lighting technique that I'm going to teach you in my work. And in 2012, that was the first year that I had my first six-figure year. And you guys, that was no accident. That happened because 2012 was also the first year that I was no longer um, beholden to the weather. I could make a schedule based on what worked for me and my clients, not time of day or time of year. Um, I didn't have any cancellations or reshoots. And more importantly, this was the first year that I actually felt 100% confident in everything I was giving my clients. I felt good about every single session that I sent out. It was, it was really life-changing. Um, and so that's where we are today. So now you know, whenever I share this timeline, I always ask myself, why did it take 12 years of going through the stress, trying to make it work, doing all the things that we do to try to work with natural light instead of just learning how to use strobes and flash? And for me anyway, it was because I really bought into a lot of the common myths and misconceptions that people have about artificial light. And um, like I said, I speak at a lot of conferences, I talk to a lot of photographers, and I know I'm not alone in this. So for today, I just want to go over three of the biggest myths about, um, well, two of the biggest myths around artificial light. There'll be a bonus myth in the end. But, um, and then we'll get into the actual framework. So myth number one is lighting is ugly. So you guys can just say if you've ever felt the strobes and flash are ugly. Um, and you guys, honestly, it can be right? Like we've all seen those images with like blown highlights or, or hot spots or, you know, the kind of stuff that looks just harsh and flashy that you think about when you think of bad flash photography or bad studio lighting. And um, one of the problems that happens with strobes and flash when you're working, especially in the studio, is that you just have too much light, which means that you're shooting at F8 or F11. And for those of us who are used to working with window light in particular, and we like that really soft look and we like shooting light wide open, shooting at F8 and F11 or in that style can kind of create outdated looking images. Um, so something like this which of course is a joke photo, right? Like this is hilarious. But I, I love sharing this picture because I do feel like this is what a lot of people think of when they think of studio lighting. They think of these images that are overly sharp, that are overly lit, that are very old fashioned looking studio photos. Um, but the reality is, is artificial light doesn't have to look like that. It can look just as soft and just as natural as window light. So these are a couple of my images that were taken in my studio with strobe. They're very soft. They have that same window light look that I would get on a perfect day with my windows. Um, this is also taken with a strobe. And these were also taken with, this was with a flash. So, and unlike natural light, what's great about working with artificial light is that it's always available. It's always consistent and it's exactly the way you want it every single time. So if you want your light to be light and airy, you can create that, right? And if you want something a little more dramatic, you can create that too. 
But the difference is, is that you get to decide how your work looks, not the weather. So it really is a great tool that can take you from just being in a place of constantly reacting to what's being thrown your way to intentionally creating, which is really fun to do as a photographer and an artist. Now, the other myth around artificial lighting is that lighting is hard. And this was a big one for me because I'm self-taught and artificial light just never seemed intuitive. I was used to being able to work with the window to be able to walk into a room and see the way the light's falling and just instinctively knowing how to work with that and how to use that. And I didn't feel like I could have that same feeling with artificial light. Um, and it didn't help that every single lighting tutorial I ever looked up seemed overly complicated, right? Like, you know, I'd get on the YouTube or whatever, and it was always, you know, these big studio setups, with multiple lights and, and assistance with reflectors and all this kind of stuff. And I, that's not the way I worked. That's not the way I wanted to work. And um, it's not what I wanted. So it just really felt overwhelming. But what I've since learned is that that feeling of overwhelm was really just about not understanding it, just like kind of the fear of the unknown. And the reality is you actually already know most of what you need to know to work with artificial light. And that's just because light is light. So if you can work with the sun shining through a window, you can absolutely work with a bulb shining through a softbox. The same rules apply. And so that's where we're gonna start today. So I want to show you how to take what you already know about working with the sun shining through a window and just use those same rules to working with the bulb shining through a softbox. So let's do it. So creating the natural light look. So for years I've been saying about my work that, you know, it's, it's the natural, a natural light look, natural looking light with strobes and flash. But honestly, you guys, what does that even mean? Because natural looking light can look different to a lot of different people. You know, natural light is varied. It can be many, many things. So when I talk about natural looking light, um, oh, I just said this can mean different things to different people. But when I talk about natural light, what I'm talking about is that beautiful north light look, that ideal window light look that I love, like on ideal days, on perfect days, I would get in my studio. When I sought to uh, teach myself lighting that's what i was going for and inside the book i go into detail about what the north light look is and and how it how it differs from like south light and west light but for today what i'm going to share is that for me that north light look was that beautiful soft light you know that that light that just kind of comes in it just kind of wraps and caresses around the subject that's what i wanted um it's it's a soft quality it has those gradual transitions into shadows, right? I also wanted to be able to work with my strobes and flash the exact same way that I worked with my window light. And for me, that means shooting wide open. I like having a shallow depth of field. I like the softness that it brings to my work, especially when working with newborns and babies. And so that was important for me to be able to recreate with strobes and flash. And then also uh, I wanted those, those gorgeous, catch lights that I get when working with a window light, those big chunky catch lights that I would get using the windows in my studio. That's what I was going for. So there are basically just three things that you need to know in order to create natural looking light with strobes and flash. So I'm going to show you in this presentation today how to create like the three things you need to know to create my ideal version of natural light. But what I want you to know is whatever your ideal version of natural light is, you can use these same techniques and these same concepts, right? It's universal, light is light. So let's get into it. So the first thing that you need to know in order to start creating natural looking light with strobes and flash is how the power of your light, so the power that's coming out of your strobes and flash is going to affect the look of it. Now, this might seem like a, a no-brainer to some, but um, it's a lot of people struggle with it. We're also going to talk about the distance of your light, like where placing your light is and how that affects the look of your light, and then the shape of your light and what that shape, the shape of your modifier, how that affects the look. 
So let's start with the power of your light. So like I said, when I'm, when I'm working with strobes and flash, my whole goal was to create that same soft, beautiful north light look, which meant soft light shooting wide open. And to get that when you're using artificial light, it really is just about making sure that the power on your strobe and flash is turned down low enough to enable you to shoot wide open the way that you want to shoot. Um, and while this sounds like a no-brainer, I know like we were talking about just a second ago, it really is where what trips up a lot of people who are first getting started with strobes and flash. So where a lot of people go wrong is that they set up their, their unit, they set up their flash, it's on full power, they don't fully understand how to adjust it or how to control that power. And so they're just flooding their images with way too much light. And that's how you're gonna get those photos that look really harsh and flashy. Uh, we don't want that. We want that soft, natural, beautiful window light look. And so really that takes turning the power down on your strobe. Now, how do you know what to set your power levels to? Well, you meter. And inside the book, I actually have an entire chapter on metering because it's so important and I'm a big believer in it. And I know that there's a lot of schools of thought around metering, especially in this digital age where you can just like look at the back of your camera and cheat it a little bit and keep adjusting it until you see what you want. But um, I'm a big believer in, in just doing it in camera and learning how to do it right. And so I'm a big believer in metering. Handheld light meter, test your light and adjust it. Keep turning your power until you're at the settings you want. Now my go-to settings, um, again, I like shooting more wide open. So when I'm working with film, I'm shooting a medium format camera, so my depth of field is always going to—it's already going to be greater than if I were shooting on like a 35 millimeter. But when I'm shooting film, I will adjust my lights until I'm getting f/4 in the shadows. And I'll, I explain this more inside the book. I go into detail about why that is and how you expose for film properly and why that's important. Um, and then when I'm working with the digital camera, I'm—I'm I'm always at uh, uh, ISO 100, and my go-to setting is f/2.8 in the highlights. And I'm choosing those settings, again, because that's the kind of light that I like. That's what I want to create is that soft shooting wide open look that I get with my windows. But again, it's up to you. So if you like something with, with a, a deeper depth of field, then you can adjust the power in your light and meter until you get there. It's really about taking control and creating the kind of images that you want based on your brand and your business. Now, the next thing you need to know is you need to know and understand how the distance of your light is going to affect the way it looks. And this is something that we know just from working with windows, right? Um, when you're working with a window, it, the closer you are to that window, the closer you are to your light source, first of all, the brighter the light's going to be. We all know this, right? And the farther away you get from the window or the light source and the dimmer your light's going to be. Well, the same rules apply with a strobe or a flash closer to light, the brighter it is, farther away, the dimmer it is, right? Again, that's why you're metering. But the other thing that happens is the closer you are to your light source, the softer it is. And the further away you get, the harder it is. And um, I like big soft light. So this is window light and this is strobe. They look really similar. Well, I use distance to help control that that look, right? Like I want that soft light that's just gonna come in and wrap around my whole subject. Um, and so to get that look, I'm always working with my modifier really close to my subjects. So I'll have that modifier maybe three feet away when just working with like an, an individual baby or one person. And then of course, when I'm working with families, I'll have to bring it a little farther away. But I'm always, I have it pretty close, like three to five feet away from my subject to help create that big, soft, light look. And then the last thing you need to know when choosing your modifiers and working um, with artificial light is how the shape of your light is going to affect the quality of your light. Um, and again, this can go back to what we already know about working with windows, which is the size and shape of your window is going to affect the way your light looks, right? So if you have a really big window, and you're working with a big window, you're going to have softer light. You're going to have more diffuse shadows. That light's going to come in and it's going to just wrap around your person or your subject, whatever you're shooting. And if you have a small window, of course, it's going to be smaller. You're going to have sharper, more defined shadows. You're going to have harder light. So if you think about the difference between being in a ballroom maybe and being in front of a big giant window and what that light looks like versus you know being in front of a door 
that has just like one of those little square windows in it and how that light's then going to come in like a beam and hit your, your subject and create a harder light. Well, the same rules apply when using light modifiers. Okay. So a big modifier is going to give you soft diffuse shadows. So this is a pullback. This is a, in my studio, giant modifier. This is a seven foot modifier, but you can see really soft shadows. And even if you look on the paper where he's sitting, you can notice that those shadows are really soft, really diffuse. And that's from getting that big modifier, right? Whereas using a small modifier, you're going to have sharper, more defined shadows. So same pullback. And now notice you can see more detail in the shadows on the floor. You've got those sharper shadows on his face. So large modifier, soft shadows, small modifier, sharper shadows. And this is good to know when you're first starting with strobes and flash, because where a lot of people go wrong is that they don't know what equipment to buy because they don't know how that equipment's going to affect the look of their light. And so what happens is they'll go in and they'll buy a bunch of gear or they'll buy the wrong gear and end up never using it and just waste money. So if you know the kind of light that you want to create, if you're wanting to create soft light, you know what kind of modifiers you need. You want a bigger modifier, right? And if you want to create more like a little harder light, something with a little more drama, then you're going to want to purchase a smaller modifier. So understanding how the, the, just the size of your modifier is going to affect the look of your light is really important. The shape of your modifier is also going to affect the catch lights in your subject size. And this is, again, really important depending on the kind of natural light you're trying to mimic. So here's an example of window light and strobe light right next to each other. And those catch lights look really, really similar. That's intentional because a square modifier is going to give you square catch lights, right? And a round modifier is going to give you round catch lights. So what does that mean when you're trying to mimic natural looking light? Well, if the look you're going for is to try to recreate a window light look, then you're probably going to want a modifier that's going to create more of a window like catch light right? So something more square, something with a straight line that looks like um, a window. Or maybe you're, you're bringing your lights outside and you're really wanting to mimic the sun. Well, the sun leaves a round circle catch light in the eye. So maybe that's what you want to, that's what you want to recreate. So you would go with a round modifier. So again, understanding how the size and the shape of the modifiers affect the light, the look that you're going to get is really important depending on the kind of light you're wanting to create. Um, I like that soft window light look. So I'm always using really big modifiers that are creating that catch light. Now, a lot of times I'm using an octagon shape, like um, an octobox or something like that. And people ask me about that all the time. Like, okay, well, what kind of a catch light will that create? Well, A, I'm using really big modifiers because I'm wanting to create that really soft light. I'm bringing that modifier in really close, like I've already said. And then the shape of that octagon, because even though they have some straight edges, you know, compared with the size relative to my baby is still going to give me those kind of squarish catch lights. So as you can see, it's this cute little muffin. Um, those catch lights still look really similar to the catch lights that I get when working with windows in my space. And there's another example of that. So those really big kind of squarish catch lights, that's what I like, but you know, you get, you get to decide what works best for you and for your work. So you want a soft, natural light look, turn the power down on your strobes, right? You're going to meter to make sure you're at the right power. You're going to bring your light in really close to your subject because the closer your light, the softer it is. And you're going to use a really big modifier because the bigger your modifiers, the softer your shadows. Let's reverse that. You want a harder look. You want something that's a little more dramatic, right? Well, then you could turn the power up on your strobe meter until you get to that ideal aperture. You're going to, you know, back your light away and you're going to use the smaller light modifier. So really it's a pretty simple formula and it can be done anywhere at any time. You also want to remember that the power and the distance of your light will affect the brightness and the softness of it. It's inverse square law stuff. Um, and that big light modifiers equal soft diffuse shadows, small modifiers equal sharp defined shadows, and that the shape of the modifier is going to sh control the shape of your catch lights. Okay. Ooh, take a break. So
What about flash? This is a question I get all the time. I work primarily with strobes and there's a whole reason why I do that, I talk about, but the same rules apply with the flash, you guys. Light is light, it's just another light source. So you can put your flash inside a softbox and get the same effect. This is my weird posing doll that <laughs> shows up in my pictures from time to time. She's very patient, she doesn't ever argue with me. But, um, but as you can see, I mean, it's just a flash inside a softbox, it looks exactly like everything else. Here's a pullback with the same flash inside just an umbrella, um, same rules apply. The only problems with the, with the flash, well here I can get into them. Okay, pros of having a flash rather is that it's small, they're inexpensive, they're easy to set up on location, um, which make them you know, kind of a nice choice for people who do work on location a lot. I personally don't use flash, mostly because most flashes don't have a model light. Some of the newer models, like um, the A1, I know from Profoto does have a model light, but most of them, most of your generic speed lights don't. I also find them harder to adjust the output. So when you are metering and you're trying to, to get your light low enough to get that soft look that you're wanting to go for, they're just harder to adjust. And sometimes they can't go as low as a strobe would to give you that, that look. They also can have a slow recycle time um, and they eat batteries, but you can, still, you can still use them. So the other question I get all the time is about equipment. And that brings us to our third bonus myth which is lighting equipment is too expensive. And I hear people all the time say this to me, like, yeah, I get it. I want to, I would love to use artificial light in my work. It's just too expensive and I can't get started. But um, like I said, I get it. I run a small business too. I know that money is tight. And the last thing you want to do is invest in a bunch of gear that you're never going to use. But the reality is you think you need a ton of gear, but you really don't. Everything I do, everything I teach is done with just one light and one light modifier. So you can get yourself a stand, a light, a light modifier, and a set of triggers, and you're good to go. Um, here's everything that I use in my studio every day, right? So not a lot of equipment. And what's great about that is that that makes it really easy to go on location. Uh, I have one person who actually has the book and sent me an email um, with a picture of her getting onto the subway in New York once they opened, going to her first shoot. And she had all of her lighting equipment in a little backpack on the subway in New York going to her first session. So you don't need a ton of gear and it's easy to take with you on location. Um, you also don't need to buy brand new or the best of anything. So the first lighting setup I ever bought cost me less than $300. I was just buying used equipment and, um, and it worked really, really well. So now this is the equipment that I use. I love the Avenger stands because they come on rollers. Again, I work in a studio so I can do that. I shoot with a Hasselblad, a Contax, and a Rolleiflex in my studio. Um, I love the Profoto B2 strobe heads. Westcott just came out with a brand new strobe head that's really great the FJ400, it's not that expensive. Um, for radio triggers and receivers, I use the Pocket Wizards and the Profoto Universal Remote. I love that remote because I work with film cameras, but what's great about the Profotos is that they also come with brand specific remotes. Um, my favorite light modifier right now is the Westcott 7 foot parabolic, and uh, I use the Sekonic light meter. So that's my list now, but when I was first starting out, it was really different. Um, I started out using Alien B lights, and I believe I got my first light for like $200 just to use Alien B. They were great. Like I said, the new Westcott lights are really wonderful, and they're not that expensive for a brand new light. Um, so shop around a little bit if you are on a budget. Look at, go on to Facebook, look in the used camera lighting gear, go to B&H, they have an amazing used camera section. Uh, you don't need the highest quality, the best brands, the most expensive brand new gear to get started. Really, light is light. So if that means you're getting started with a $100 speed light flash, then do it um, because it really will like open up your whole world once you start using lighting. So the takeaway for today is this. Light is light. You already know how to do this. Um, if you can work with the window, you can work with the strobe. Remember that the power and the distance of your light is going to affect its brightness and its softness. 
that big light modifiers equal soft diffuse shadows, small light modifiers equal sharp defined shadows, um, and that the shape of your modifier is gonna affect your catch lights. Learning to use lighting for me is what helped me create my signature look and build my brand. I know now that everybody who walks into my studio is going to get the same quality images and going to get look the same look that I show in my portfolio so consistently every single time. Um, and having that really consistent brand has helped me stand out in a saturated market. My work doesn't look like anybody else's and I'm really proud of that. And that helps me stand out and, and uh, get more clients. And that's what's helped me build the business to what it is today. What's really great though, is that now I know I can create in any situation I'm in. So if I walk in and I wanna use window light, I can. If I walk in and I don't wanna use window light or I don't have enough window light, I can do that too. And my work is gonna look the same. There's gonna be a consistency regardless of the medium that I'm working with. And again, that's good for me, it's good for my brand, it's good for my clients, it's good for my business. So we're gonna get into some Q&A right now. So if you wanna start answer, asking your questions in the chat box, go for it. But what I do want to say, if you take one thing away from today, I just want it to be this. Don't let bad light hold you back, okay? Um, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to your clients to be able to consistently produce beautiful work regardless of the weather or the windows or the available light in the room. And you deserve to feel confident every time you pick up your camera. Um, and also, of course, your clients. Your clients deserve to get the best of you every single time. So the people who come to you in July should have the same images that the people that come to you in December and vice versa. Your clients deserve that. So when you're ready to get started, you can grab my book. <laughs> it will go into detail, obviously, about all of this. It walks you through step by step how to craft that, my version of Natural Looking Light, but I also want to show you how to figure out what you want, what your version of Natural Looking Light is, and then go on to create that. Um, so I'm just going to pull this out and then we can go stop share and get into Q and A. So Did it work? <laughs> we don't have any questions yet. So I'm just going to say if, for anyone who's tuned in, if you have your questions, go ahead and submit them now, but, um, let's just take this time. Why don't you tell people a little bit more about what they can learn in your book and also where they can find you on social media too? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, well, in the book, I'm going to teach you how to create natural looking light. So I really, it's really broken down. I should grab it. Do you want me to grab it? I have a copy right here. Yeah. Excuse me. Ta -da! Isn't Zoom so fun? We can just do things like that. It is. <laughs> so here it is. Great. Crafting the Natural Light Look, and it really goes into detail about the overview that I gave you today. So we started off with just foundations. So we talk about light quality, um, hard light versus soft light. What does that mean? Light direction, how you can control your light and the look of your images based on how your light is falling on your subject. Um, and there's lots of pictures, lots of behind the scenes. Um, I, from then we get into equipment. So we go into detail about the, what equipment you need to get started, but also like, so what you need to know about what the equipment does as far as shapes and sizes and all that thing, just so you can make an informed decision. So you aren't spending a lot of money buying stuff that you're never going to use and you don't need. So that's chapter two. Uh, we go into a lot of detail about that. I have a whole equipment list on what I use and why. Um, what I used when I was starting out, what I use now. Um, from there, we get into understanding and controlling exposure. And what I really love about this part is that um, it's broken into information for both film photographers and digital photographers, which I thought was really fun. I can't remember when the last time just a min mainstream book on lighting has had information for both film and digital photographers, which I think is exciting. Thanks, Rocky Nook. <laughs> And then, like I said, there's an entire chapter on metering. And this is something I'm very passionate about as an educator. Um, 
metering, as far as I'm concerned, is a lost art and something that all photographers should know how to do. And so we get into different kinds of metering, reflective metering, incident metering, um, what you need to know when you're metering with digital cameras, what you need to know when you're metering for film cameras and why, go into detail there. Then we get into actually crafting the look. So I show you how to create my version of natural light. There's a whole section on understanding light, like I was talking about, north light versus south light. Um, and what you need to know about that. And then in chapter six, we start breaking it down into um, lighting groups. So showing you, I think there was just a question. So how to go from lighting one person. So I start with one person to two people, to three people, to four, um, to five. So we, there's even six people there. So we do talk about how you can still use one light, one light modifier to light groups. I talk about how to use one light, one light modifier to photograph children being running around and playing. I don't know how many lifestyle photographers there are, but I know a lot of the people in my online courses are lifestyle photographers. So they're going into people's homes and they're having the same struggles and the same inconsistencies when relying on natural light. And so being able to to bring a light in and see how to set it up in a way that looks really natural inside of a person's home, still get that movement, still get that, that organic feel is really important. And then the last chapter, which I think is really fun, is a couple of case studies. So we had actual people coming into the studio and go through step-by-step -step an entire session from photographing baby to siblings to families um, and show you that whole thing. And we have a couple of those different ones. So. There's a lot. It's a lot. It's all pretty good information. Not a lot of filler. You just get right into it in this one. Yeah, we did have two questions come in about photographing groups. Uh, one is, how, uh, how do you apply the natural light look to a larger group? Say a group of eight to 10 people. Do you need mm -hmm. more lights or larger modifiers? And then kind of hand in hand with that is another question of how do you get your soft look when photographing a group since your aperture yeah. will have to stop down? Yeah, so I do talk about that. Like I said, we have an entire chapter to that, to photographing groups in, in the, the book. But everything I do, you guys, and I've been doing it for 20 years, I'm doing with one light, one modifier, even groups. So really, it's again, just understanding that distance thing. So that really getting a hold on inverse square law. I don't like to say inverse square law because I feel like technical terms and stuff freak people out. I don't want to do that. It's really easy, but it's basically just understanding how as you pull your light away, your spread of light becomes bigger. So if you're already working with a really big modifier and you pull it back some, I teach feathering. I teach you how to just angle it a little bit so you can still use that one light and light a group of people. Obviously, if you're at a wedding and you're shooting 20 to 30 people, at that point, you're probably going to want to bring in another light. But um, as far as like eight people, six, eight, ten people, you can absolutely still do that with one light. And you'll probably just need to bring in like a V flat or a reflector or something to bounce a little of that light back. And again, I go into detail about that inside the book. So we, we have a whole chapter on lighting groups. And you can still get that soft natural light look. So one thing, I'm wondering if it will show on this book, but... Um, I'm always amazed by my own clients who come in and just assume that my studio is this bright light, you know, airy natural light studio. And it's not, it used to be a doctor's office, but like, so here, this is, this is six people. I don't know if you can see that still very natural, very natural light look soft. It looks like my signature style. So it's 100% doable. Great. Uh, someone else, uh, ask the question. Well, they mentioned that some other photographers don't like TTL, which, which, you know, you listed as a pro. So do you want to talk about why you do like that? I never use it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had it on a pro on my list because I know that's one of the reasons why people like using speed light flash. So it can be a pro. And honestly, a lot of the newer Flash units are super smart. They're just the technology is getting better. So I know on the on the pro photos, for example, their TTL is really good, and a lot of people have a lot of success with it and love it. I'm a big believer in metering, and maybe I'm a little old school in that, but I think it's important to really get in, especially if you're going through 
the trouble to create and craft your own light, like understand what you're doing, learn how to do it right and why, which is why I have the whole section on metering and teach people how to do it. Um, this is an interesting question, which someone just asked if, if this lighting method would work for tabletop items. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah, there's a lot of people, um, both who have purchased the book and then also inside my lighting course online, who do product photography. So I have a lot of florists, I have a lot of food photographers, you know, that sort of thing. Because again, it's just about mimicking that window light look. And so whatever you can apply it to, now our book um, really focuses on portrait work, but the same rules apply, right? Light is light. So you, can you take this same technique and photograph a product or flowers or pets or whatever? Like, absolutely. Um, you can use it however you want. Great. Um, I have one more question. And actually, this question comes from me. Oh. <laughs> I'm looking at both of us in the camera. You know, we both wear glasses and... During quarantine, I've been working on my own little photo project. And how do you deal with glare? You know, when you're shooting people who are wearing glasses. Um, yeah, so you don't get that. Sometimes, like sometimes you turn and there's no glare, or I turn and there's no glare, but then other times there is. So how do you navigate that? Yeah, and again, I talk about that in the book because that's one of the common problems that people um, encounter. And really, like overcoming glare in glasses is as simple as just where you place your light. So you can just bring your modifier up and you're going to erase it. So if your modifier is here, you're going to get a reflection. And so you just keep moving it until you get it up and out. But um, you can check out, you can check out the book Mercedes and you can work on that. Let me know. <laughs> but it's actually a pretty easy problem to solve, even though it's a really common problem. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, we don't have any other questions coming in right now, so I just want to remind everyone who tuned in, you know, thank you for joining us this afternoon, and tomorrow you will receive a link to watch this uh, replay if, if you choose to do so. If you miss something or um, if you have a friend who would find it interesting, you can forward the link over. And also, that email will also have the coupon for 40% off any version of Sandra's book. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Sandra. This was really helpful. Yeah, it was super fun. Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye.